Well, yes, uh, we will bring you that conversation about uh, the follow-up on the ruling about uh, by the Supreme Court on the Emo governorship election appeal. But in the meantime, and in continuation with our theme, our focus uh, related to the military, we bring you this interview, which was earlier conducted with uh, uh, Chief Philip Asiodi, former Minister of Petroleum Resources, a man with many caps. Well, I uh, did that interview. Here it is. Thank you, Chamberlain. We have with us right here now Chief Philip Asiodu, who was permanent secretary before, during, and after the civil war that Nigeria undertook in the 60s. And he is also former chief economic advisor to President Obasanjo in this Fourth Republic. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. There are many accounts of what happened during the civil war, before the war even happened. Uh, many of them are skewed depending on whoever is giving the account at the time. You were an insider in government before the war and during the war. What were some of those things that people may have missed? Well, the point is that um, there was, after the time we got independence, there were still some political problems outstanding. Such as? The minorities question. For instance, we had that commission which agreed that the minorities, especially in the Delta area, had what you call South-South these days, had some legitimate grouses, and that they might, could be accommodated by creating a separate region. But that if they did create a separate region, it will delay independence, which we had agreed. Now, this uh, commission was in 1958, and it would delay independence beyond 1960. But our founding fathers said, no, we keep to our independence date. We will solve these problems later. So at the, you had that agitation going on. The Middle Belt was also restive. And in fact, the army had to be deployed to keep peace there. And all that was there. And then we became independent. But the most critical issue was when the action group, the leaders, the ruling party in the West, got into internal trouble, you know, between Akintola and Awolowo, and in fact, split. And the NCNC and the NPN, NPC, the NPC, who were the coalition ruling after the 1959 election, exploited the situation and created Midwest region. They had been a legitimate and continued demand for a Midwest region. But interestingly, at the beginning of it, it was to be Benin, Ondo, and Wari province. It wasn't a question of tribe. It was a question of devolution and, you know, for greater effective this thing. But later on, it became Midwest, just Benin and Wari province. Now they created Midwest region. Even though there had been a longer standing demand for Calabo Goja rivers. That was not created. The Middle Belt was not created. If there had been more statesmanship, and even not just creating Midwest, say if we had created, if they had created Middle Belt state and core or Middle Belt region and COR, core Goja rivers region, the history of Nigeria might have been different. But that wasn't done. And so that continued to create problems. But with the split of the action group, you know, and just dividing up Western region, not addressing the other two that was there. But the last straw, was 
Well, we had the elections of 1964, because the earlier one was 59. And I've, every five years, you had to add parliamentary elections under a parliamentary system. Now, that 64 election, unfortunately, OBGA decided to boycott the elections because they said people were being nominated and opposed in the North. But under an electoral system, whoever shows up and is a candidate, you vote if as a majority is elected. So they didn't think what happens after. You just say you're boycotting election. And of course, they proceeded to boycott the elections. And of course, those who stood in those constituencies were declared elected. And this, this was part of... Uh, this is 64. Uh, and this was because of some... The political uh, uh, permutations then were along ethnic lines? No, they were not definitely along ethnic lines. Because don't forget, NCNC had won a majority in 54 in the West. But over the three months period, a lot of things happened. And when they assembled to elect the premier, Zeke had gone confidently as leader of NCNC, only to see people deserting, particularly the Ibadan uh, Mabalaji NCNC Grand Alliance which has six members, and five with Akinloye went away. Only Adelabu remained in the NCNC. But what I want to tell you is that that now led to Zeke becoming leader of the opposition in the West when he thought he would be premier. Now, if the NCNC had had the premiership East-West, and uh, things might have been different. So how did all this lead to the coup of 1966? I'm not telling you, because all these stresses, the military had been deployed, trying to keep the peace. When you tell soldiers, come and keep peace, you know what you're looking for, maybe that's a part. But the point is that this almost played in, it would play into the hands of people who say, these politicians can manage. There were people in the military, Different cadres. We understand some bejos were planning, some con lieutenant colonels were planning, because um, unfortunately for us, Yadema had done a coup and seized power in Togo. So, law and order almost breaking down. So the military came in. Then, unfortunately, we had lost the Minister of Defense, Rebado. He had died, who, if he was still Minister of Defense, might have been able to take preemptive action. Because there is no coup that happened in Nigeria without a lot of warning that a coup would uh, But unfortunately, Balewa had called a Commonwealth Conference. And for the first time, British Prime Minister, everybody, were in Nigeria to discuss the seizure of power in Rhodesia by Ian Smith and what to do. So this meant that for two weeks, the prime minister couldn't be concerned with all these, you know, detailed reports on the security situation. And as soon as they departed, even with one of the head of state still here, the coup took place. And that led to the counter coup of July in 19... 1966. How did the federal government at that time manage that coup? Well, once uh, the soldiers agreed that they can take orders from no one else plus Gowan, then, you know, for about two days, people didn't know. There was no effective authority. Ronsi had been killed, but we didn't know if it was killed or not, he wasn't around. Ogundikwe, who was next to him, tried to give orders to a major. That one said he wouldn't take orders from him. He'd only take orders from another man. 
and of course Obundikwe then took refuge in a British man of war, which was in the harbor. So for about almost two days, no, until some federal palm sex. Then the civil service was still respected. Federal palm sex, including an Igbo palm sex, now went to Ikeja cantonment, where Gawana had gone and was held hostage in quotes, went there and they were challenged. Say, what tribe are you? Because if you say Igbo, we're gone. They said, we are civil servants. And that was enough. Prestige was there. They allowed them. So they now went. When they discovered, only Gawande would this thing, came back and reported. And we said, well, so be it. We must have government. And so Gawande came from Ikeja to Lagos. And we had prepared questions and answers to the Federal Palm Sex, a few of us, committee. Because you have to introduce him to the international press to say Nigeria still has a government. This is the government. And luckily for us, there was no question he was asked. We had not briefed him on, you know, and that went there. So that was how order was reestablished. As for the soldiers who thought blow up Qatar Bridge, and Arewa, you know, north to the north and all that. Well, <laughs> we have single line railway. You put your children in railway and all that, it's going to the north. Another train is coming from the north. If there is no authority to say, please, you wait, you pass, chaos. Anyway, they were persuaded that you can't break up Nigeria that way. But as a consequence in the, one of the agreements was that soldiers should be taken as much as possible back to their area of origin. One of the main um, items that's played over the years in this whole conversation about the uh, civil war is the Aburi Accord. Yes. Some say that you know, it was the civil servants that advised the head of state at the time, General Ibuko, on not to um, follow the Aburi Accord with the Southeastern government at the time. You and see, yes and no. One, General Gowan actually misunderstood in the preliminary discussions with Ojuku and all that the nature of the meeting in Aburi. He probably thought. It was just, you know, chaired by Ankara. Tell fellow officers, please, enough is enough. Let us get back to order. And he thought it was just going to be that. And did not inform the secretary to the government that there was going to be this kind of conference, you know. And so when the night we uh, did uh, two days before, he told the secretary to the government, she said, well, I, I, we don't go to meetings unprepared. What? So I'm not coming. He didn't go. A permanent secretary went, the late Oba of Bini, Iradua, was at Prince Akenswa then. He went because he was covering the position of principal private secretary, more or less, to take minutes. Now, when they got to Abuja, Ojuku had come with a heavy group. I mean, Aburi. Aburi. Heavy group of advisors, including one of the most brilliant Nigerians of our generation, of that generation, the Paos Okibo, or the palm sex and all that, that worked out positions. We had not, General Gawan hadn't gone there with advisors of that caliber. Nothing was prepared beforehand. But anyway, if they thought this was to be breaking of ice, shaking, because since the programs started in September, the military governors had not met at all. 
and Ojuku, in fact, was still contesting that Gawan should not be head of state, Ogundikwe, the most senior, should be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, so they now came back with something which amounted, if it was implemented, to a confederation in which Nigeria would cease to exist. So this was analyzed and said, is this what you people went to do? <laughs> what was, was that your intention? It wasn't. And so despite that, General Gawan still kept to, insisted that the decree which would come out must contain one or two clauses, if, which if it came out as decree number eight, which the Bar of France under Juku rejected, saying on Aburi we stand. If they had accepted that decree, Nigeria would have disintegrated within three months. Because under that decree, each region or state would have his own army, each region would have his army. And if there was an attack on Nigeria, it will only be after consultations that they would agree if they will unite to defend Nigeria. Two, the, nobody could be made ambassador. Nobody could be promoted super scale. That is from assistant secretary to senior assistant secretary without unanimity. Unanimity of? All the military governors, you know. So if those two clauses were implemented, <laughs> you don't have a country, you know. But they rejected decree number eight, said on Aburi we stand, which was outright confederation. After the war, what efforts were made by the federal government to try to appease? Yes, General Gowan at the time said, no victor, no vanquished. Was that enough? During the Civil War, we were able, I and a few of us, we did quite a bit of helping in presenting what were federal government hopes post-Civil War about what became three hours, rehabilitation, reconciliation, reconstruction. Now, in 1969, while the war we saw it was coming to an end, we were able to organize a conference in Ibadan with Chief Simeon Adebo, our permanent representative in the UN, as the chairman. We had the academia, politicians, students, journalists, to talk about what Nigeria should do after the war. And it was the conclusions of that conference. And it was produced in a book edited by late Professor Nitri and late Alison Ayeda that led us to do the 7074 plan and also 75-80 plan. The first thing is rehabilitation. Feed people, get them together. No question of repetition of massacre or killings or somebody's bear from, because war has, war has ended. No victor, no vanquished. And that was going on. And reconstruction. Materials were given to enable people uh, build back their shacks. But quite interestingly, in places like Lagos, even the people who had properties and gone away, rents were collected, kept intact. When they came back, they were given by the Wanko and others. It's only in Port Harcourt, unfortunately, that they did these abandoned properties and took over people's properties. And you know, the Igbos had developed much of Potakot. That was very, very unfortunate. And you must praise the Igbo man 
for his courage and resilience in no time at all. Despite the pogroms and all that, they were back in many, they were back in many of these cities, you know? And today, despite what we are hearing about hip hop and mass up and all that, outside the big companies and conglomerates, when you look at the second tier of activity, traders, businessmen, the Igbos are in every state. This is where we are now, 2020. Yes. And it seems some people still need that healing, that reconciliation, reintegration. What sh do you think we should do now going forward? Good qualitative functional education for everybody so that we are no more talking quota based on tribe or based on this thing. Because we'll be equal. We'll be talking about the best man for the job. And as Achebe said, you want to play international match, you take your 40 level. Where do you go? That's one. Two, go back to our priorities. Exploit agriculture, agro-allied, process it for export. So I'm saying that if we go back to education, genuine development, then we really have the basis of healing. Well, this is uh, an amazing place to live. We we'll have to thank you very much for your time and for your thoughts. Chief Philip Asiodu, CFR, is uh, a permanent secretary during the Civil War and is a former chief economic advisor to President Obasanjo in the Fourth Republic. We we'll have to thank you once more. Thank you very much.